Let's take our Bible this morning and let's go to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. This, uh, this week I got a message from, from someone. I, I, I want to read it to you because once in a while I like to share with you the messages that I get. Not because it really I'm trying to, to say anything about me. Usually the, the messages I get are, are thanking me for the message or whatever. But I, I just want you to see the heart of some people. I think, I think when you really grasp this message and we've been free for a while, it's easy to forget what it was like when we were still not free. And we still, there was still a lot of religion in us. And I got a, a message, is, and I'm not going to use the person's name because this message goes on YouTube and all over, and I didn't get his permission to use it, but I'll just call him Bill. He lives in Connecticut. And he sent me a message this week, and he said, you know, most people think that I don't believe in God. I may give that impression, I guess. I've tried them all, Baptists, Catholics, Methodists, et cetera, et cetera. And they all put me out because it's all hellfire and brimstone. They seem to be big on the damnation of man. And I found a lot of hypocrisy in them. But then you came along, and I watched you on YouTube and live stream and read your posts, and you always talk about the grace and the goodness of God. I found it to be a breath of fresh air. I guess what I'm saying is I'm listening. This is the part that really got me. He said, I'm listening for the first time in a long time. And I like what I hear. You know, really the desire of my heart is that everybody feel like Bill. And this morning I want to talk about what might be the, the biggest, the toughest obstacle that we encounter on our, on our grace walk. And I guess the thesis of my message this morning is pretty simple. It's that we have found the biggest obstacle on the grace journey, and it's us. It's us. We're going to look at some scripture this morning, and we're going to talk a little bit about how to, how to maneuver around this obstacle of us and get us out of the way so that God can do all that God wants to do. With, uh, with the least amount of resistance from us as possible. So this morning when you leave church, I hope, I hope you have learned a little bit about how to move you out of the way. Amen? Now look what it says in Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. I'm just going to read verse 5 and 6. I want to read it out of the New King James, then we're going to read it out of the New Living Translation also. But let me read it first out of the New King James. Titus chapter 3 verse 5 says it's not by works of righteousness which we have done. But according to his mercy, he saved us. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done. But according to his mercy, remember I've defined mercy for you a whole bunch of times. Mercy is when you, when you don't get what you deserve. So it wasn't by something we did, it was by him not giving us what we deserved that he saved us. And he did it through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Now in the NLT, it reads just about the same, but just a little bit different. In the NLT, it says this in Titus chapter 3, verse 5. He saved us, not because of the righteous things that we had done, but because of His mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and a new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Now, when we come back to the New King James Version, it says that it was not by works of righteousness which we have done. Now, I... I guess we could say that, that a work of righteousness is anything that we do, anything and everything that we would attempt to do to try to make ourselves right with God. Anything that you have stored away in your mind that you think will uh, improve the way that God sees you, that you could do yourself would be a work of righteousness. 
And when we were steeped in religion, we've all come through a lot of phases, and we know that religion has no shortage of works of righteousness, things that are required of us to make God smile at us, to make God uh, open his arms to us, to embrace us, ultimately save us. There are lots of things that are, we look at that we're required to, to touch base that we need to do. But Paul told Titus that it wasn't by anything that we could do on our own that saved us. Now for many of us, the tump, toughest hump, I think, in our grace journey is getting our ego out of the way. Getting our ego and setting it on the back burner and admitting that the best part of the good news about being in Christ is this. Are you ready? Toughest part is getting us moved out of the way, getting us back on the, on the back burner and coming to the point where we realize and, and, are, and are willing to admit that we did not do a single thing to position ourselves in Christ. Now, let me just let that sink in a little bit. Because I'm probably talking to people that still are clinging to some things that you thought you did to position yourself in Christ. A prayer you prayed, a confession you made, uh, some type of, of work of righteousness. And a work of righteousness, again, if I were to define a work of righteousness, is anything that you do, that you confess, you pray, you believe, have to have faith for, that will make you right with God. That's what righteousness means. It means being right with God. So... So, so when we talk about a work of righteousness, we're talking about anything that we do ourselves that has enabled us to make God bless us, to save us, to smile on us, or to be happy with us. And the good news is that you did not do a thing, and this is so hard on the ego. You did not do a single thing to position yourself in Christ. In fact, long before we recognized we had any need in our life, the Father had already unilaterally made a decision to include us in Christ. When we were still blind, when we were still ignorant, deceived, believing in illusion about ourselves, thinking that our identity was based in what we thought about us or somebody else thought about us or what our denomination told us about ourselves, when we were in that position, the Father had already, by Himself, made a decision to place us in Christ. Now there's some really some awesome verses that, that come along and, and back up this whole idea that this whole thing was God's idea from the beginning. It was God's idea to, to make it happen. And it's God's idea to bring it to absolute finality in perfection. I love the verses out of, out of, out of 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8, 9, and 10, where he really addresses this, this thing that it was God's plan and God's initiative from the start and that you had nothing, absolutely nothing to do with it. And these are some of the verses that I, I like to read every once in a while because I think we should put ourselves in remembrance of these things often because they have a way of slipping away and the world has a way of creeping in. And this idea that we need to do something to perfect ourselves has, has just this way of wearing on us and, and we feel this separation, this gap with God. And the only way we know to close it is to try to do something ourselves. So we read verses like this in 2 Timothy chapter 1. And in and, and verse 8, I'm just going to back up and read this out of, out of my own Bible. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 8 says this, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of, of our Lord nor of me as prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. Now in the original text there's no division of verses. So when we finish that, when we finish verse 8, which says the gospel according to the power of God, and then it goes right into verse 9 and says, This power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace. Now this, somebody ought to shout right here. Which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. So let me just let me read that again with the impact now that you understand that this was given to us in Christ before time began. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of, of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings of the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us. What was it that saved us? God saved us. And he called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and his grace which was given to us 
in Christ Jesus before time began, but now has been revealed. And that's what's going on today. Now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light, to visibility through the gospel. Now what's happening today in a bigger than ever fashion, this verse 10, it is being revealed to us in what he's saying in verse 10. The revelation is coming to us. We're now seeing that Jesus has abolished all forms of death and he's brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. This good news. The gospel is a bigger message than who goes to heaven and who doesn't go to heaven. The gospel is the totality of the good news of everything that Jesus brought to us through his death, his burial, and his resurrection. It is, the, it is the sum total of the package of good news. And there is no bad news in the good news. If there's any bad news woven into the good news, then it's a diluted message of good news. It's not good, it's partial good. And we cut our teeth on a partial message of good news. It's good news but. It's good news if. It's good news when. There is no if buts wins in the good news. It is all strictly, to totally good. Amen? Now this seems, when you read verses like 8, 9, and 10, and whenever I, 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 you know, I post or do things on something like this, it seems to the religious mind that this is heresy. We're so, we're so fix, fixated on us doing something and we've been so programmed to that that when we read that he did this for us in Christ before time began, it, it honestly, it seems like heresy because it's too good to be true. It's too good to be true. But the, the gospel is this. We are not in Christ because of our doing. We're not in Christ because of our choosing. We're not in Christ because of our believing. We're not in Christ because of our repenting. We're not in Christ because of our praying. It was His choice. It was His decision. It was His initiative. It was His will. It was totally the work of the Holy Spirit that put us in Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30. Hope you, hope you track with me through the scripture this morning. If nothing else, you should write these verses down so that you can come back later and just, just meditate and contemplate them. It says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and, and verse 30, it says, But of Him, but of Him you are in Christ Jesus. Now if we were to put that into today's language, we would say, Because of Him you are in Christ Jesus. Paul said it, but of him you are in Christ Jesus. It's because of him. It's not because of you that you're in Christ. It's because of him. And because he has placed you in Christ Jesus. And when we say that you're in Christ Jesus, you know, being in Christ and Christ in you is the same thing. I'll read it later, but John 14 and 20 says, In that day you'll know that I'm in the Father and that you're in me and I'm in you. So when he's in us and we're in him, you can use those two interchangeably. We are in, we're in union. I'm working on a teaching right now about union because union is much stronger and deeper than relationship. Right? We've concentrated for a long time, and I don't want to preach the message this morning, but for a long time we, we, we majored on the fact that we had a relationship with Jesus. Can I tell you it goes a whole lot deeper than relationship? In fact, He is in you and you are in Him. And He is in the Father. There is a, a union that is there that far surpasses just a two-way relationship. Nothing of the gospel is transactional. It's not him doing something and you doing something to complete the transaction. It is, it is a totality of, of union. And I said I didn't want to get into that. I'm not. The, the point is this morning, it's because of him, 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, because of him you are in Christ Jesus. And we read in Timothy that he made this choice and decision long before time began. And because you're in Christ Jesus, now look at the rest of that 30th verse. Because of him you are in Christ Jesus, and Christ Jesus has become for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Now let me just let me keep unpacking the good news this morning. 
The gospel does not demand your righteousness. The gospel does not demand your sanctification. I grew up in a church that demanded your sanctification. It was a second definite work of God's grace whereby inbred sin was removed from the believer empowering him for life and service. It was something you had to do and enter into. The gospel doesn't demand your righteousness. It doesn't demand your sanctification. It reveals it to you that you are righteous. It reveals to you that you are sanctified. It awakens you to what you have and who you are. So, you can see that the Father, in just a couple of verses we read this morning, you can see that the Father did everything necessary for every human being to be included in Christ. It was totally a unilateral move on His part. And we've seen this morning that Christ has done everything necessary to reconcile us to God. You were placed in last Adam before time. You were placed in last Adam before time. So when first Adam came along and sinned, it did not change God's mind. When, when first Adam came along and sinned because you were already placed in last Adam, Jesus then didn't become God's plan B. Jesus was coming whether Adam ever sinned or not. Because God wanted to join himself to all humanity. And in one, in one person, God and man came together. It was in Jesus. God loves you so much. The Father loves you so much. He wanted to come and be one of us. Jesus was coming whether Adam sinned or not. Don't ever buy into the idea that, Adam, or that Jesus was God's plan B. Adam's sin did not take God by surprise. Before time began, God called the end from the beginning. So you say, well, okay, that's what God did. God, God did everything necessary to put me in Christ. Jesus did everything necessary to reconcile me to the Father. What is my part in this? Your part's very simple. Are you ready? You want to know your part? Here's your part. Your part is to consciously remain right where you have been placed. Which is in Christ in union with the Father. Your part is just to stay put. Your part this morning is just simply abide in Him. Our part is a non-part. Our part is a doing nothing. Our part is a submitting to what it always has been and always will be. That's your part. Your part is to remain where He has placed you. And don't try to perfect yourself out of that place. Because frankly, you are complete in Him. There is, no more, there is no more perfecting to do. You are as perfect as you're ever going to be. Your awareness and your consciousness of that perfection will continue to grow throughout eternity. But you're as good as you're ever going to get. Now, I read Titus 3, verses uh, 5 and 6 this morning. I want to expand on that out of the message. I want to go back to Titus chapter 3, and I want to read verses 5 through 8 out of the message. Because I, I just want to keep Im Im imprinting on you this morning that you had absolutely no part to play in any of this, that the Father loved you so much that God planned this so well that all our, our duty is now is to remain placed and solid and firm and to stay entrenched as we are included in Him. Now watch this out of the message. It says that He saved us from all of that. It was all His doing. And I could have read the earlier verses. He saved us from all of that. Now whatever all of that is in your life, He saved you from all of that. Amen? It was all His doing. We had nothing to do with it. Boy, that hurts my ego. I like to feel like I had something to do with it. I had nothing to do with it. He saved me from all of that. It was His doing. We had nothing to do with it. He gave us a bath, a good bath, and we came out of it as new people. That's like born again. He 
did all of it, gave us the bath. We came out of it as new people, washed inside and out by the Holy Spirit. Verse 6. Our Savior Jesus Christ poured out new life so generously. Verse 7. God's gift has restored our relationship with Him and given us back our life. And there's more life to come in eternity of life. So this is not just a temporary thing, amen? It lasts forever. When God does something, it lasts. It doesn't vacillate. It doesn't change. It is fixed. Verse 8. You can count on this. I want you to put your foot down. Take a firm stand on these matters so that those who have put their trust in God will concentrate on the essentials that are good for everybody. So he wants you to find security in this so that you can go on and think about other things other than trying to fix your relationship to him by doing something that is good. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read verses like he did it all, he took care of it all, he planned it all, he performed it all, he has put me in Christ automatically by what he has done. You know what it does to me? It makes me love him and appreciate him more. It doesn't make me want to go out and sin. It doesn't make me want to go out and act crazy. It makes me want to become fully who I already am. And the Holy Spirit does continuously remind us and reveal and unveil to us who we are. So by placing us in Christ, by declaring us free from the power of darkness and by putting us, translating us into the kingdom of his dear son, the Christ that is now within you, and here's where he wants you to begin to see and to begin to concentrate, the Christ that is within now becomes our righteousness, our redemption, our sanctification, our holiness. Everything that we need is already within us because Christ is within us. So his message to you this morning is this. His message is to simply remain where he has placed you and stop the toil, stop the work from trying to become. Now, as you, as, you, as you stop the work from trying to become, you'll find that you can draw on the infinite supply that is within you that will meet every need. Now, here's what I've discovered, that as long as I'm trying to become who I already am, as long as I am trying to perfect my actions or works. I don't draw on what is within because I'm depending on what is without from what I do. And it's, it's tough, it's tough on our learned behavior to just let go of it and let him begin to work it out. A couple of weeks ago, I was just, I was floating around in the pool on one of those, uh, those air, air, air raft kind of things. I wasn't really, I was just chilling. Realizing I didn't have to, I realized the sermon factory was shut down. I didn't have to go anywhere, be anywhere, had no appointment. And, and the Lord just dropped into my spirit. I feel it was the Lord. He said, you know, son, he said, shouldering the burdens of life. And man, we all get burdens, don't we? We all get these things that try to, try to come into our life. He said, shouldering the burdens of life and even trying to deliver yourself from sin is not viewed by me as a helpful contribution. Because <laughs> I was thinking, you know, I had been thinking about a few things that could become a burden. And when he just said... You're shouldering these burdens and, and even sin. If you try to deliver yourself from sin, I don't see that as a helpful contribution. In fact, in fact, he went on to say that my endeavor is an active resistance to his provision. I said, come on. You know, I said, Spiritual maturity really is, is achieved by our decrease, by our rest, and an increase in his consciousness in our life. And I guess we could just say that the sheep isn't looking for suggestions from the sheep, or the shepherd isn't looking for suggestions from the sheep. He's not looking for your help. 
Sheep, all sheep do is they simply accept and receive the shepherd's provision. The sheep, when they look at the shepherd, they, they depend on the shepherd to get them to the green grass. The sheep fully trust, rely on the, the, the care of the shepherd. So the, the bottom line, folks, is when we try to attempt to do something, when we try to assist him, when we try to improve ourselves, to add to what he's already done, you know what? It's a, it's a huge... It's a huge flag of unbelief and disobedience. It really is ungrateful, no matter how good our intention is or our motivation is. When we attempt to do something to improve or add to, it's showing that we are not believing what He has done and we're disobeying what He's provided for us and we're actually ungrateful. Listen, I want you to get your head around this. Our labor to gain what has already been given is a rejection of the finished work of the cross. Our labor to gain what has already been given is saying that what He did on the cross was not enough for us. It's a rejection of the finished work of the cross. Paul wrestled with this in every church he established. This thing of getting our ego out of the way, putting it on the back burner, and coming to the realization that I had no part in this, and it frees me then to just lift my hands and say, Father, I love you, I praise you, I thank you, I want to discover all that you have in my life. I want to find out who I always have been and have been blind to. Paul wrestled with that in every church in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4. It says this, you have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law, which is any work, any performance, any act of self-righteousness. It, 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 in our minds, it estranges us, it separates us from Him, and you have actually fallen out of grace. Now, I don't know where you come from, but I always learned that when you fall out of grace by sin... I didn't know you could fall out of grace by trying to do good. You who attempt to do good, you who attempt to be justified, to become right in God's eyes, to be just as if you never sinned in God's eyes, you have fallen. The grace does not work in your life. And Paul fought this in every church and there is this. I know there is, there is, every religion has quick solutions, offers quick solutions for this need that we naturally have, and I don't know why we naturally have this, but we have this natural need to try to improve our performance. And we're always trying to crank out our efforts to improve on the traits that we think we're lacking in. You know, maybe you're, you're here this morning and say, I, I just don't love people like I should. So you, you decide, you say, bless God, I am going to love people. And as soon as you make that kind of decision and think now you can make a decision and you're going to love people, you know what you're going to find? You're going to find people frustrate you, irritate you, get under your skin, they're on your last nerve. And then when it happens, you feel like, man, I failed and I'm, I'm separated from God. Wherever we have, wherever we have in our perception, wherever we have traits and fruits that we feel are lacking, whether it's love or faith or righteousness or obedience, whatever it is, this, se this sense of separation that those, those feelings create compels us, it seems like, to climb back on this treadmill, I guess that's the best way to say it, back on this treadmill of self-effort and try one more time. And this cycle then just continues of trying, and then we fail, and then we get under guilt and condemnation, and then we promise God we will never fail again, we will do it, and then we come right back to the start of the cycle of trying again, and the harder we try, the more we fail, and the more we fail, the more condemnation we feel, and the more guilt and condemnation we feel, the more we promise God we'll never do it again, and once we promise God we'll never do it again, we come over back on the treadmill and we try it again. And we just don't break that cycle. It just runs counter to our culture, doesn't it? To let His divine influence create effortless change in us as we remain firmly positioned where He has placed us in Christ without our efforts. 
Come on, church, if, if the Father was able to begin that good work in us, then we need to lean back into Him and let Him work it through to its completion. So what do we do during this whole time? I'll tell you what we do. We consciously, daily, remain where we have been placed and we refuse to come out of that place. Now John 14, 20. In that day, Jesus said, you'll know that I'm in the Father and that you are in me and that I'm in you. This, is one, this has become probably one of my top five verses. At that day, and, and for a lot of you, this is that kind of day. You're going through that whole process right now. In that day, you will know that I'm in, in my Father and that you're in me and that I'm in you. And as that day, as that day becomes clear, you know, what you, you know what you find? You know what this verse really brings? This verse brings unbelievable growth and security. This verse does for you automatically what all your efforts in trying could never get done for you, which is that oneness, that union that you have with him. And he just said, when that day of discovery comes and you set you on the back burner and you finally understand that I did all of this for you on my own, I planned it out, I executed it, and I brought it to completion, and now all you have to do is to remain firmly fixed where I have placed you. Stay at peace, stay at rest, and let your consciousness and your awareness of me perpetually grow. As that day approaches, you're going to find your, your fulfillment of things that you earnestly tried to make happen yourself and failed at, now coming to pass. For me, that big revelation was the fatherhood of God. I think that helps us grasp the heart of love that provides all things for those created in the image and the likeness of the Father. When you get that, that real revelation of the fatherhood of God, and God wants us to see it that way. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5, he, he secures us into this. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5, he says that we were predestined to become adopted as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. He predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. So this morning, that's your position. He, he wants you to feel secure in this. We spent a lot of time this morning, I, and I hope we've been able to draw some, some truth in and, and shed some light on the fact that he placed you in Christ apart from your effort. And he did this because he has drawn you into a family relationship. He predestined. That means he set your destiny ahead of time. That's what predestined means. It means he set a destiny for you before you were. And the destiny that he set before you were was that you might be a son. And he did, he, he did the adoption through Jesus. And he didn't do it by what you did. He did it according to the good pleasure of his will. See, he declared before you were born your position as a son. Because he wants you to feel secure. And he wants you to feel secure. You know why he wants you to feel secure? Because he wanted to include you in that circle of union with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he wanted you to know that by, by sonship, you have been granted entrance into that circle of love and union. And he wanted you to never doubt it. Look at verse 6. Look at verse 6. To the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. He made us accept. He qualified you, again, he qualified you from all of our feeble attempts to qualify ourselves. He set your future for you, then qualified you for that future. So he didn't come to you and say, look, I'm, I'm predestined you to be a son of God, but now you're going to have to qualify yourself. You're going to have to toe the mark, you have to toe the line. You're going to have to dot the I's, cross the T's to make your way in. He said, no, 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 no. He said, let me just tell you something. I have predestined you to become a son, to be a son. That is your destiny I've set before time. And he said, not only have I done that, I qualified you for that place. I qualified you for it. You did not qualify yourself. Come down to verse 11. One more verse. Verse 11. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, 
being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So what counseled him into all of this? His will, his plan, his desire, that's what counseled him into your adoption and qualification into sonship, placing you in Christ apart from your good efforts. Am I going too fast? Let me take a drink and let you smooth out. Okay, so what do we got here? He formed you. He put his life into your nostrils. He breathed into you the breath of life. He set you on your feet and said, that one is very good. You know, that's what God said about you when he formed you. He looked at you, he's mm, very good. Then he takes what every parent should take, which is full responsibility for the one that he brought to life. Give me a good amen. amen. He took full responsibility for you when he breathed the breath of life into your nostrils, set you up on your feet, said, that one is very good. Then he said, I take full responsibility for you. I've predestined you to be a son. I've included you in the circle of love with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I have qualified you for that position. Now, you know, when I, when I really put the pedal to the metal on this kind of grace, I get all kind of messages and responses usually. When I come with a message that is totally apart from all religious effort, I get, I get a lot of questions, and, and Monday morning I'll have 10 or 12 in my box. And they always, they always come around this, this thing. Pastor, I, I heard the message, I love it, I like what you're saying. It resonates in my spirit, but I've got a question. And the questions are always this. What about my constant failures? What about all, what about all the, the mess-ups? And I'll, I'll usually write back, look, God, God doesn't see your mess-ups. He sees you through Christ. And then they always write back, but you don't know what I've done. You don't know how bad I've messed up. These, these failures have a way of weighing us down and making us feel inadequate. And you know what Paul called those things? Those failures that we experience that weigh us down, that make us feel inadequate, make us feel like we're unworthy. Paul called those high things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. So you, you, I'm, I'm imparting to you this morning knowledge of God, right? We're talking about who you are in Christ, the fact He placed you there. I'm giving you absolute true knowledge. But then there are things, because of our failures, our shortcomings, what we feel are inadequacies, that try to exalt themselves against that knowledge and render that knowledge powerless and ineffective. And Paul called those high things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. See, this morning you may know your true identity. You've, you've sat here long enough, you've gone through enough weeks, enough months, that you know your true identity. Your true identity is image and likeness of God. You were created as image and likeness. He looked at you and said, very good. He never changed it. You've always had his image and likeness. He's never been separated from it. You know your image. You know your identity. And yet, these feelings of failure try to war against that identity and make us feel defeated and condemned in our minds, creating then that illusion of separation from God. And when we have that illusion of separation, the only way we know to, to close the gap is to do something good and religious. Pray more, fast more, read more, give more, do more. And it's a vicious cycle. Paul hit that thing that was exalting itself in Romans chapter 7. You know that, that classic thing that Paul went through in Romans chapter 7, it, it, starting in verse 19, where he said, The good that I will to do I do not, but the evil I will not to do, they, that I practice. Now here's a guy, Paul is saying, here, here's a guy who knew his identity, knew who he was in Christ, wrote two-thirds of the, of the post-resurrection scripture, and he's, he's walking us through this thing that tries to war in our minds and exalt itself against the knowledge of God. And he said, for the good that I will to do, I don't do it. And the thing I don't want to do, I find myself doing. Can anybody give a witness to that? 
He said, now if I do what I will not to do, it's no longer I that doing it, it's sin that dwells in me. He said, I find a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. I know who I am. In other words, I've got the identity. But I see this other thing that is always whacking away at me, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. He said, I, this is a terrible dilemma. And 2,000 years later, we're, we're battling the same thing. You come in on Sunday morning, and I, I pump you up. And you leave out of here knowing your identity, and you're all happy. And then as the week goes on, it wears down, it wears down, and you, you blow your stack, you, you, you shake your fist in traffic, you know, you say a few words that you shouldn't say. At least you've been programmed by religion at their worst than other words. They're just words. But they wear on us and we get to feeling, and this is the whole thing Paul was going through, and he finally said, oh, wretched man. He's just, wretched man. He was not a wretched man. He was a son of God. And we come to that place too sometimes, don't we? Just, you wretched person, you will never make it. You will never amount to anything. He said, who's going to deliver me from this, this body of death? That's not, not very positive. See, that kind of thinking that Paul's illustrating right there, 19 through 24, that's what brings this mental separation that needs to be brought into alignment of Christ's obedience as you. Even if you feel like you, this is you disobeyed, you have to know that he has placed you in Christ. Listen to me. Jesus was your obedience. So a little later in 2 Corinthians, come over there, 2 Corinthians, he addresses this thing. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, look at this, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he, he, he says how to deal with this. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4, he says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty to God to the pulling down of those strongholds or those things that try to exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. Verse 5, he said, Casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, how? You bring every thought into captivity to the obedience, not of you, but into the captive to the obedience of Jesus. The pure grace gospel demolishes strongholds if you hold the pure grace gospel. The gospel demolishes those mental speculations that are based on faulty sense-based thinking and it takes those perceptions we have and brings them into the obedience that Christ brought as you. Now, it says in, in verse 4 that our supernatural weapon is the gospel. Look what he said in verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The supernatural weapon you have is the gospel as the good news, minus any bad news. And I hope your, your, your filter is strong enough now that when you watch Christian television or anything else where there's some good news and bad news, that you can filter out the bad news and hear the good news. The gospel good news minus any bad news as it penetrates our alienated mind and replaces it with the mind of Christ, the separation evaporates. And Paul said in, in Romans 7, 24, he said, Oh, wretched man, who's going to deliver me from this mess? Then in verse 25, get ready to show Romans 8, 1. In Romans 7, 25, he said, I thank God through Jesus Christ. So he goes through the whole dilemma of what a mess and how jacked up he is. And he says, oh, wretched man that I am, who gets me out of it? Is there any solution? Then in verse 25, he says, I thank God that there is. That it's because I'm in Christ. I'm firmly fixed in that place. All of this other stuff going on does not mean a hill of beans. It is not me. It, is, it, is, it, it, it means nothing. Then he goes into that famous verse in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1 and says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. 
Now see, religion's caveat is you have to be in Christ. And you get in Christ by doing something. Now I hope I've spent enough time this morning in the first part of this teaching, and if you didn't catch it, get a CD, to show you that you are in Christ. That he placed you in Christ before time began. He placed you in Christ before the foundation of the world. He placed you in Christ before you were a glimmer in your daddy's eye. You are in Christ. So are you in Christ? Then there is no condemnation to you. Even though you walk through Romans 7, 19 through 24, and you find yourself doing what you don't want to do, that does not affect you. You are in Christ. There is therefore no condemnation. Now religion comes along and says, here's another caveat. It's only to those that walk according to the Spirit and not the flesh. Now, walking in the flesh is when you come out of placement and try to accomplish it yourself. And whenever you try to accomplish righteousness on your own, it produces condemnation because you can't do it. So when you walk in the Spirit, what it means is you remain firmly fixed in Christ. Look at this. There's therefore no condemnation to those that are in Christ. That's you. Now the only way condemnation can come in is if you remove yourself mentally from that place where you have been firmly fixed. You're not coming out, but you can think you were. Like Paul did in Romans 7. He thought he was. He wasn't, but he thought he was. And when that... When that occurs then, condemnation and guilt overtake you. And the way to avoid that is to remain in the Spirit, remain firmly where you are and where you have always been. So, what is he saying? He's saying you need to opt out of your independent thinking and refuse this treadmill of performance that says, I can perfect myself by what I do. Now, when you hit this point in Romans 8, 1, when you, when you got it, you say, I know, I got it, I'm in Christ. Things are going to happen this week, going to try to make me feel like I'm out of Christ. I know that I'm in because he placed me there before the foundation of the world. He adopted me, predestined me to adoption as a son. I know who I am. I know where I am. I know what my identity is. I'm firmly fixed in that. Whatever wars against me, it's a high thing trying to exalt itself against the knowledge of God. But I fix my mind on the pure gospel, apart from works, apart from effort, apart from law. And as I do, I receive the mind of Christ and I keep myself fixed in the spirit. And I don't walk in the flesh. Amen? Now at that point, the power of the gospel comes and begins to remind us of that 1 Corinthians 1.30. Because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who was made for us wisdom, righteousness, redemption, sanctification, everything you need. So at that point, we are reminded of that, and we can remain firmly fixed. Now here's what I honestly believe. I honestly don't think that we can understand who we are until we stop trying to make ourselves into something that we already are and have always been. At some point you're going to have to stop trying to make yourself into who you already are. Watchman Nee said it like this. I, I really love this from Watchman Nee. Watchman Nee said many of us have spent most of our life trying to enter a room that we are already in. Boy, doesn't that say it. Many of us have spent most of our life trying to enter a room we are already in. It's, it's, it's hard to do that, isn't it? See, you are, you are and you always have been in Him. Could it be that's why it's been such a struggle for you to try to be in Christ? Because you've been trying to get yourself into Him when you've already been in Him and you can't get into a room that you're already in. That natural mind bent toward performance to please, that mind that judges other people so that we feel a bit more secure in ourselves, or we look at their performance and say, well, I'm not so bad. They don't seem to pray any more than I do. They're not in church any more than I am. I don't think they're doing any better job than I I guess I'm not so bad after all. That mind is really hostile and frustrated toward God. And it's really not subject to the reality that God has prepared for us. 
Maybe that's why the Bible says that we shouldn't trust our mind. We shouldn't trust our own understanding. We shouldn't even lean toward it. But in all our ways, we should acknowledge Him and He would direct our paths. I, I found in my life the greatest insight and revelation comes when I shut down my thinker and I bend my inner ear to the knower. And I stop the effort, I stop the striving, I can hear much better. See, body of Christ, listen, we're coming into a now awareness of our completeness of Him apart from any works that we can do, apart from anything that we can do to try to make ourselves right with Him. So when you have problems, when difficulties come in life, rather than trying to hit those problems head on, how about if we begin to seek first the kingdom of God and the consciousness of our righteousness and let the results come from Him, and the results that come from Him may just bedazzle us. Now, this morning I'm talking about a big Jesus. I hope your Jesus is getting bigger. I'm talking about a Jesus that keeps growing and increasing, not that He does, but your consciousness of Him does. My Jesus is much bigger than He was 10 years ago. My Jesus finished a whole lot more on the cross today than he did 10 years ago. The complete work of Jesus is much larger to me than it was five years ago. It takes a big Jesus to do what we're talking about this morning. It takes a loving Father whose love grows richer and stronger and makes us more secure. It's a one-way love that is so predominant. God's love is so powerful, he doesn't even demand a response from you. It takes a Holy Spirit that is faithful, that proves himself time and time again as you remain fixed in Christ. Now I want to let you in on a divine secret this morning, and I'm closing, I'm all done. I want to let you in on a divine secret. Are you ready? The Father has fully and completely adopted you. Do you know why he fully and completely has adopted you? It's not because he needed children. That's what I always was taught. That's what I always thought. God made all of us because he wanted a big old family. No, God didn't adopt you because he needed children, but because he knew that you needed a father. He knew you needed a father. Rest in his provision, the father's provision. Rest in it. Trust him to fully work the process. And believe in his ability to bring to a successful conclusion every last thing he has started. Faithful is he who began it, who will complete it. All right, now I got a whole bunch more I want to say about this because I've been gone four weeks and I've been getting this some thought. So I'm going to keep going, I'm keep going on this little theme next week because we have found the biggest obstacle and it's us. But we're removing us out of the way, and as we remove us out of the way, Jesus gets bigger, the love of the Father grows stronger, and the faith of the Holy Spirit, faithfulness of the Holy Spirit grows more predominant in our life. Amen.